So we've been talking about how different organisms acquire and process nutrients. Previous lectures, we've talked about photoautotrophs, or the land plants. In this lecture, um, we're going to continue to talk about the chemoheterotrophs. So in the just previous lecture, we talked about the fungi. In this lecture, we'll begin talking about the animals, which are another example of a chemoheterotrophic group. So remember from the previous lecture that animals are ingestive heterotrophs, and this is in contrast to absorptive heterotrophs like fungi. So when we talk about ingestive heterotrophs, these are things that take food either into their bodies or take it into their cells before they break it down into small enough pieces to move across cell membranes and actually get them into the individual sort of cells to use for the cellular machinery for basic metabolic chemical processes at the cellular level. And most Animals use either guts or digestive tracts, and digestive tracts are really just a sort of more uh, complex type of gut. But a digestive tract or a gut typically consists of three major pieces, a foregut, a midgut, and a hindgut. So whether you're an earthworm, a grasshopper, a human, or a dog, all of these things have a digestive tract that is composed of a foregut, like you see in green, which is typically a mouth, an esophagus, and a stomach. A midgut that you see in pink here, which is typically your small intestine. And then a hindgut, which are the yellow parts that you see here that typically consist of a large intestine, rectum, and anus. Okay, So how do animals actually go about acquiring nutrients? Um, well, food processing typically involves several steps, the first of which is called ingestion. So ingestion is just the act of eating or taking food in. So it's bringing packets of food into the digestive tract, like when you bite off a piece of food and chew it up. That's ingestion. The next step is called digestion. So digestion is just when food is broken down into molecules small enough to be absorbed across cell membranes. Okay, so you're breaking down food by sort of processing it mechanically and shaking it up and mixing it up and also adding digestive enzymes that chemically work at those food molecules to really break them down into very smaller constituent molecules. So you're like breaking down polysaccharides into monosaccharides. You're breaking these polymers into the monomers and even smaller molecules that break them up. For the next stage, which is absorption. So absorption is just when your cells actually take up the molecules across the cell membranes, okay? So this is something that typically happens in your small intestine to a smaller extent in your large intestine, but it's the uptake um, of these smaller molecules that uh, result from digestion. And it's once again, you're moving them across cell membranes and actually then getting them into uh, your bloodstream and then also getting them um, from the bloodstream so that they can be delivered to other cells and still be small enough to get delivered through the cell membranes of other cells in your body. And then the last part is elimination. So basically any leftover undigested materials. So like if you eat a, something high in fiber, like I said before, humans aren't very good at breaking things like cellulose and other things like that down, so fibers. And so that undigested material gets passed out of the system. And so this is uh, a large intestine, rectum, anus. That's where that stuff is happening in a human digestive tract, okay? So let's first look at ingestion across the animal kingdom, okay? So there's a couple different main feeding strategies that animals can use. The first one is suspension or filter feeding, where essentially an organism is collecting organic matter suspended in water or suspended in air. Um, so you're filtering out a bunch of little particles and then you're moving those back to the gut. So a baleen whale is a great example of that. So many whales are baleen whales. They have this thing called a baleen, which you can see a close up of here, which is basically a bunch of ridge teeth, almost like a comb with a bunch of hairs at the end. And so they'll filter a whole ton of water through this baleen. And then little shrimps and krill and things like that will get caught in this baleen and go down into the hairs. And then the water will wash off and then they'll move those things, those little krill and shrimp and things like that into the gut. So they're filtering smaller particles out of the water. So this is suspension or filter feeding. There's also something called substrate feeding. So this is basically feeding on organic matter um, that the organism lives in, either by sort of burrowing or crawling through it. So you can think of a worm crawling through the dirt and digging a little tunnel as it goes and eating sort of uh, bacteria and things like that 
and nutrients that are in the dirt. Or this could be through a leaf, like you see uh, this caterpillar doing here, or soil, or wood, or whatever it is, but they're feeding on the substrate that they live in. There's fluid feeding, um, where this is basically just feeding on the fluid of other organisms. So this could be an, a mosquito tapping into your circulatory system to drink your blood. This could be um, other insects called sap suckers and aphids that can use these sort of piercing mouth parts to tap into the sap of a plant and suck the sap out. Okay, but they're feeding on fluids of other organisms. And then there's probably what you're most familiar with, which is bulk feeding, which is ingesting large pieces of food. Um, and so I want to spend a little time talking about um, the, the adaptations that organisms have evolved specifically for this act of bulk feeding or ingesting large pieces of food before they're totally broken down. Okay, so one of the major parts of bulk feeding is the use of jaws and teeth. So obviously to take in a big chunk of food, you need to have a jaw to sort of like wrap your mouth around that piece of food and bite it off. Um, and you need teeth to do that as well. And so if we look at all of the vertebrate organisms, so you can see these are all the vertebrate organisms like mammals, birds, turtles, lizards, frogs, and different fishes, okay? And what you can see is um, these groups here from cartilaginous fishes all the way down all have jaws. However, there is this group of vertebrate animals that don't have jaws. These are the jawless fish. So something like lampreys, for example, you can see they have these little teeth here, but they kind of suction onto things. They don't actually have jaws. And these are typically parasitic organisms. They're blood feeders that'll just sort of latch onto something and drink the blood. So they're not, they're more fluid uh, feeders uh, than they are bulk feeders. And so if you look at the jawed organisms that are the, the bulk feeders that help organisms ingest all these different kinds of food other than like blood meals, the evolution of jaws is actually believed to have come from uh, a variation and change in gill arches, okay? So if you think about uh, the common ancestor back here, it was probably a gilled fish of some sort. And gills, so this is like a breakdown of an organism that's got gills and it has these gill arches here. So this is ba basically a cartilage type thing that holds up these little slits for the gills so that these um, aquatic organisms can breathe. And what you'll see is as you look at the early jawed fishes and modern jawed fishes, you have a modification of these front gill arches, so a modification of these bones to become more jaw-like and basically provide this sort of structure and scaffolding for the jaws and for the growth of teeth and more complex structures. Okay, And so they believe that jaws evolve from uh, modification of those gill arches. And we get these crazy organisms that have very complex jaws and very strong jaws, whether you're talking about a great white shark or eels, which interestingly have two sets of jaws. They have this first set that you see out here and then an inner set of jaws, kind of like the movie Aliens, that pop out and will grab a fish and then pull it back into the back of the mouth so it's easier for the eel to hold on to it. When we have to look at other major feeding adaptations, um, teeth are another really important one. And teeth are a great example of how structure is related to function. And if you look at the diet of different toothed uh, animals, you can see how specialized their teeth are for the particular habitat or diet that they have. So they have the same general teeth set up where they have incisors, canines, premolars, and molars. So like on a human, you have your incisors in the front, your canines, your premolars, and your molars in the back. And you know, the incisors are typically sort of for cutting, the canines are typically for ripping, and then the premolars and molars are typically more for grinding things up. And so an omnivore, like a human that eats plants and meat, kinda has an even breakdown of all those things, because you wanna do some ripping and some grinding. Whereas a carnivore is really specially adapted to have all this stuff sort of sharp and made for sort of gripping, killing, and ripping off large chunks of flesh. Whereas an herbivore, you have these teeth really specialized where you've got these really uh, big emphasis on the grinding premolars and molars. And then these teeth up front, the canines and incisors are really for sort of ripping up little bits of plant and then moving it back to these back teeth so they can grind it up. And so you see structure once again relating to function where tooth and jaw arrangements have really evolved to suit diets. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about ingestion and some of the adaptations that animals have evolved for ingestion. Now let's talk about 
digestion or this process of breaking food down that you know we think of this typically happening in a human's stomach so once your food's in um, you've got to digest it and there's two major types of digestion I want to talk about there's intracellular or within the cell digestion versus extracellular outside of the cell digestion so an intracellular digestion this is digestion that's actually occurring within the cell so this happens by phagocytosis. So remember, phagocytosis is you have a food particle that sort of broke, brought into the cell, and so you have the cell membrane pinching off around it. That food particle, particle has not actually been broken down yet, um, and it's not actually really moved across the cell membrane yet. It's just been brought into the cell. And it's not until it's broken down within the cell that the food particles actually move across the cell membrane in this little food vacuole that's been pinched off, okay? And so this is something that we see in protists and also in sponges. So this picture of SpongeBob is really inaccurate because SpongeBob, he's bulk feeding right here, and that's not how sponges eat. So sponges, remember, are a very simple uh, type of animal, but they are in fact animals, and sponges also do this intracellular digestion through phagocytosis, okay? So the way sponges work is this is the body of a sponge. It's a multicellular organism, and what it does is filter water. So it's got a bunch of holes in it, and it filters water through those holes. So it has these little sponge feeding cells called coanocytes that all be flapping around inside of the cell. That creates a current that moves water through, and then there's these little food particles that are suspended in that water, okay? And so those food particles, what'll happen is they'll get stuck onto these collar particles Parts of this coanocyte um, and then those food particles will basically get moved down this little filter part here and then they'll get phagocytized where they're further breaking down in these other cell types so I don't so much care about you knowing all the names of all the different cell types that are in a sponge but I want you to understand that sponges don't have a gut they are filter feeders that phagocytize many small particles so they have this very interesting um, way of accomplishing intracellular digestion that's unique to the sponges. Okay, so let's talk about now extracellular digestion. So remember, extracellular digestion is the breakdown of foods in compartments continuous with the animal's body. So basically, extracellular is you're breaking down the food inside the body of the organism, um, but you're not breaking it down within the cells of the organisms, okay? And so there's a couple different types of extracellular digestion. The first type is extracellular digestion that happens in an organism with what's called an incomplete digestive tract. So an incomplete digestive tract is one that only has a single opening to the digestive cavity. So you don't have a mouth and an anus, you've only got one hole, okay? So the food goes in and the waste goes out of that same hole. Your mouth and your anus are the same hole, okay? And so this is something that we see in jellyfish and anemones. And once again, jellyfish and anemones are animals, and they're animals with an incomplete digestive tract. So they'll ingest food, so it allows them to take in a big chunk of food, and then they'll bring it down into uh, basically this gut area, where it's broken down through digestion into smaller particles that can be absorbed across this gut, okay? So they're broken down into molecules that are small, small enough to be absorbed across the cell membrane. And then there's gonna be some wastes that are left over. So the orange dots represent nutrients that are absorbed into the body of uh, this anemone. And then there's the waste particles that are purple here that are left over that are eliminated out of the same hole that they went in. So this is an example of incomplete digestion. Okay, or I'm sorry, this is, the digestion itself is complete and the absorption is complete, but it's using an incomplete digestive tract. And this is in uh, contrast to a complete digestive tract. So a complete digestive tract is one that has two openings, okay, a mouth and an anus. Um, and typically you have regional specialization. So there's not a lot of specialization in an incomplete digestive tract in the sense that this is sort of like the stomach and the small intestine and the large intestine is all happening in this gut here. Whereas there's much more specialization in a complete digestive tract where you have a sort of mouth region, a sort of stomach region, and a sort of uh, small intestine um, and large intestine region, okay? And so having each of those sort of specializations, whether you're talking about an earthworm or you're talking about a grasshopper or other insects or you're talking about a human or you're talking about a dog, having all those specialized regions um, and the breakdown of those regions allows them to become more specialized and much better at the processes 
that they're involved in. So they're a little bit better at absorption, they're a little bit better at digestion than you might see in an incomplete digestive tract because they're so specialized for just that one function instead of this single sort of gut area having to do all of those functions, okay? So, for example, let's look at the absor absorptive portions of a digestive tract um, with something with a complete gut. Um, and if you look at, for example, the small intestine of a human, if you were to unravel the small intestine, you'll find that typically absorptive portions of the small intestine, just like anything with a complete digestive tract, are typically very, very, very long. So if you were to unfurl this uh, small intestine, it'd be super long and often very uh, folded. So lots of folded walls like you see here, all these little fingerlings that stick out inside of the small intestine, which once again is for nutrient absorption. Um, these things are called villi. So why have a very, very long small intestine and why have um, all these little um, folds in a small intestine? So hopefully you brought this back to structure being related to function and having that high surface area to volume ratio is great for increasing absorption, which is the major job that the small intestine in the diet um, that the small intestine and these absorptive portions of the digestive tract are involved in. Okay, so having that high surface area to volume ratio, lots of skin for absorption of nutrients. All right, which of the following is true? All right, if you said D, filter feeders like baleen whales are examples of ingestive heterotrophs, that is a correct response. Fungi are absorptive, that's true, but they are not autotrophs, they are heterotrophs. Most fungi have a high surface area to volume ratio to decrease rates of water loss. Having a high surface area to volume ratio, that's true. Fungi do have that, but that's not going to decrease rates of water loss. That's going to increase rates of water loss, okay? Saprophytic fungi get most of their carbon from a mutualistic relationship with plants in which the plants share their sap and sugars with the fungi in exchange for nutrients. Remember, saprophytic fungi feed on dead plants or animals. So this is not really a mutualistic relationship. A dead plant can't get any bent benefit. So this is describing a mutualistic relationship, okay? For which, or for most animals, large nutrient molecules must be broken down before they can be ingested, okay? So this is false. You can, um, you, you can ingest lots of large nutrient molecules without really breaking them down. So you need to chew the stuff off, but you're not really breaking down those large nutrient molecules yet, okay? So this is a false statement. It's a digestion where those large nutrient molecules are typically being broken down, not ingestion. Next question. All right, if you said A is true, that is right. Sponges and protists are ingestive heterotrophs. Um, insects and humans have an incomplete digestive tract with their mouth and anus in separate locations. That's false. That is the definition of a complete digestive tract, and both insects and humans have that. In animals with complete digestive tracts, the mouth and large intestine are the locations where the vast majority of nutrient absorption occurs. That's false. Mouth is where ingestion and some digestion occur because your saliva can start to sort of break down molecules a little bit more. Um, the small intestine does the majority of the absorption, okay? So um, the mouth and large intestine is not where the vast majority of nutrient absorption occurs. It's the small intestine. It's advantageous for locations of nutrient absorption, like the small intestine, to maintain a low surface area to volume ratio. That's false. They want to have a really high surface area to volume ratio so that nutrients are not absorbed too efficiently. Um, or high surface area to volume ratio so the nutrients are absorbed very efficiently. Four main parts of nutrient intake for animals are not inclusion, digestion, excretion, expulsion. They are ingestion, digestion, absorption, and elimination. Okay, so up to this point, I've been giving you a sort of summary of everything we've gone over. I want to challenge you now to go back to the previous slides and create your own summary of what we covered um, in this section of our lecture.